Chase Thomas podcast. The Chase Thomas podcast. <laughs> um, my nephew needs me to record. See, I hate. I already hate it. I hate it. All right, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Chase Thomas Podcast, where I'm still the aforementioned Chase Thomas coming to you live from Knoxville, Tennessee, Everything School HQ. We got a packed house once again here on tonight's edition of the show. We've got Round Ball Ramble, Swish Theory, Basketball Intelligence own Corbin Ford. Corbin, good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening. I'm doing well. Happy to talk ball as always, especially with a busy day like we've had unbelievably busy we have breaking news and then actually not breaking news and who knows where things will be once this pod ends in 40 minutes and who the head coach in the milwaukee bucks it might be corbin it might be chris it might be me we don't know also here old friend og dating back if i like look pulled up the archives here of like when chris walder first appeared on this very program i think it might be six seven years ago that i've known this man but chris walder of odd shark raptors republic I knew him back in the day at Bleacher Report, and I mean, I, there just the list goes on and on here. But Chris, good evening, sir. How are you? Good to see you again, Chase. Yeah, we we uh, OG did some podcasts way back when when we were talking professional wrestling, and we were joking about it before recording here. Like, I'm I'm growing up, man. We're we're escaping the kiddie table. We're talking some NBA hoops today. Some again, like you mentioned, like a lot to discuss tonight. Absolutely. Um, we will leave the OG Ananobi trade and the Pascal Siakam trade away, Chris. You, you've gotten enough of that. And we, we know. We, we know how uh, we know. Raptors fans were kind of divided on that <laughs> one. You were like Jon Snow in Battle of the Bastards uh, going up against uh, Masai and what he ended up getting for Pascal. So we'll we'll save that for, for another pod potentially. But hey, we'll see uh, how that ultimately goes. Magic Johnson's a fan, I saw on Twitter, of the trade uh, by the uh the Indiana Pacers for said uh wing but we start off here the news of the hour we'll see who's the head coach it I mean maybe when this goes up an hour from now but Chris you're new here you get this first Adrian Griffin fired by the Milwaukee Bucks today Milwaukee's I think 30 and 13 at this point uh still a top four seed in the east played really good ball of late um now he's he's fired it looks like doc rivers is the favorite um apparently the nba is now going the hockey model which rocks and you being a canada guy are familiar with this where my atlanta hawks hired quinn snyder at the end of last year and that was like something you just don't see very often in uh at the nba like the hockey it happens all the patrick wall just got hired as the islanders uh head coach in the middle of the year usually in professional sports they don't do that. They just have an interim and they ride it out and they let them get a whole new staff in the off season. That's not what's going to happen here. It might be Jeff Van Gundy. It might be Mark Jackson. It might be Doc Rivers, but it's going to be someone else that they are going to hire. It seems like to address this It's not going to be Joe Prunty the rest of the way here in Milwaukee. What say you about what is going on in, uh, in Wisconsin right now, Chris? Yeah, I got a little bit of a flack about it on social media when I said, yeah, I wasn't really surprised that the Bucks mm. canned him. I thought maybe they would at least do him the courtesy of letting him go through the rest of the season and then just admit that, hey, this probably wasn't the best hire for the direction we're trying to go in and just bring on whoever they want at that time. But they pulled the trigger very, you know, considering they're what, they're like the second best team in all of basketball, not just the Eastern Conference, but like the entire league. But when you kind of like dig deeper into it, we were seeing kind of like the signs early in the season, like that Giannis's uh, relationship with Griffin probably wasn't as strong as they would have liked to would have been right out of the gate. You look at the Bucks' defense right now, something they hung their hat on last season, it's bottom third in the NBA. And you just made this big blockbuster trade to bring on Damian Lillard. Damian Lillard is not getting any younger. Like if mm. you can't afford to blow an entire season like this, and they clearly weren't confident that if they once they get into the postseason, they were probably like, well, in the state that we're in right now, we are probably looking at another early exit, despite what our seating is in the East right now. So they try to want to, I guess they just kind of want to salvage what they have at this time. Maybe a new head coach, new philosophies, new defense, hopefully a stronger defense will inspire this team. Because if you look at kind of their recent performances, like they're just getting, they're putting up big numbers for other teams like 140, 130 points a night. I know the NBA is a scorer's league right now, but you have to stop somebody at some point. 
the Bucks are not doing that. So personally, I'm not surprised that Griffin kind of got the boot this early, but I can see why the rest of like basketball Twitter has kind of been an uproar. Why didn't they let him stay longer? Yeah, Corbin, were you the same as Chris? Were you not surprised that this happened even at the the point of where the Bucks are in the season and just where they're they are record wise and that they didn't just let this play out through the postseason and see what he does with this group or uh what what say you corbin yeah no i'm, I'm with chris i mean I'm, I, you hear things you know on twitter certain you know the vibes were off right there were several scenarios where it was different there was pieces on the athletic it was you know i'm not a big fan of reading the twitter space of like the camera zoomed in on just the sideline during <laughs> random points in action but like when i did like you you watch enough ball you watch enough stuff you know okay it's kind of weird you know um it felt very much like the 2015 2016 david black caps like yeah. yeah you're successful your record looks good you have the talent there but it's what's behind the scenes right and like yeah, a lot of that doesn't come to light. Uh, credit to them for keeping a lot of that in-house, right? But, like, enough came out that you knew something was there, right? So, I, I definitely, you feel bad. I mean, I feel bad for a guy like Adrian Griffin. You try for, you know, dang near a decade. Well, over a decade, 14 years or something to go for a head coach job, and you lose in, like, five months. Yikes. But, at the same time, like, yeah, it was what it was. And that's unfortunate, but that's the reality of the situation. And, um... Yeah, I, I definitely wasn't surprised on that. I guess it was like, wow, like randomly it felt like in my mind, I was like, didn't they just come off a win? Now, mind you, mm. probably played scrappy, as scrappy as a four and 39 team can play the last two games they played Milwaukee. But in my mind, I immediately went back to that game, like, and it was far longer than that. it was just odd timing. But I mean, it would have been odd timing regardless, right? When you're 30 and 13, whatever the case may be, it's going to look weird no matter what you do. But yeah, I, I just, it, it, it's, it's unprecedented. Like, I just am very curious what Milwaukee does because there's so much pressure on whoever takes over this job. Like, you gave up all your assets for Damian Lillard. You're rumored. I mean, I'm listening to Chris Haynes and Mark Stein on their podcast this week talk about the Bucks looking at Caruso, looking for an on ball defender, looking at DeJounte Murray. And that would take a three team because of what they'd be able to offer the Hawks. Like, they're going to have to get creative if they want DeJounte Murray. So they're in this win now mode. They make the trade for Damian Lillard. The uh, the defense was obviously going to take a hit for the offense. Chris Middleton. I mean, it's just you're counting on him or you're hoping he will be healthy enough for one, at least one more deep playoff run uh, with Giannis and company um, in the last little bit of his uh, NBA prime. And then you have Giannis, who's still playing at an MVP level. Like I was talking to Ty Windish of uh, Eurostep uh, last week. And it's like Giannis, uh, I think he worked, I forgot who he worked with uh, over, maybe he worked with Akeem for the first time ever uh, this past offseason. And he's adding post moves and Giannis is just playing again at an MVP level. It's just boring that Giannis is playing at an MVP level because you have Embiid having dropping 70. You have Jokic playing the way he is. You've got just dudes all over the league that are still playing at an MVP level that we kind of take Giannis for granted. And they're just right there. They're just... I mean, no one wants to play them. They're going to be a hard team to beat four times in the playoffs. They had the embarrassing postseason loss. That's why you move on from Budenholzer. But like, who are you bringing in? Who are you saving your season for? Is it how much of this was just he was a bad fit culturally, but also like the defense that he wanted to run that Ty and I was talking about was not what they had the personnel for. So if you're bringing back Brooke, then you can't do the defense that he wants because you're going to have to live in drop coverage. You're not going to be able to switch everything. So it never made sense. And then the all-time bad, the, the bad vibes alert button was uh, Terry Stotts just quitting, like right before the season gets started. Like your lead assistant just gone. Like that might have been enough for us to be like, well, that's weird. And that just doesn't happen in the NBA. Or that's usually just not a not a good sign. So, I mean... I'm sure it's an NBA job. Uh, a lot of qualified candidates are going to want this, but to jump in parachute in here in the middle of the year where the expectations are NBA championship. I mean, the reason doc, I think makes the most sense here is because like, who cares? Doc's coached everybody. He's been in this, like he's fine. He'll jump right back into broadcasting. He's like, yeah, I don't care. I'm good with stars. Like, I don't care about the pressure. Like it's fine. It gives me something to do the rest of this, uh, this NBA season. Like, I understand the logic of bringing him in mid-year, but I don't know, Chris. Like, is this is this Doc's job? Is it If you're a Bucks fan, do you think this is an upgrade over Adrian Griffin? Do you want to see them go somewhere else? I mean, what do you what do you do here? Well, whoever they bring on, whether it's Doc Rivers, according to CNN Sports, which I just learned was a thing tonight, that was kind mm -hmm. of a crazy outlet to drop that, even though it doesn't look like it's true 
uh, yeah. just putting it out there. But at the same time, like if, if you can trust in Doc Rivers to improve the team's defense, which I think is the glaring weakness at this point, and you look at the standings right now, there is a strong possibility that Milwaukee would probably match up with the Indiana Pacers in like a first round matchup. And Indiana has already beaten them four out of five times. They have the mm. best offense in basketball. If you're not stopping anybody and you're going head to head with that prolific offense, which just added Pascal Siakam, you are screwed from the get go and you are ending up with heartbreak once again. Now, is Doc Rivers the guy who can possibly get the Bucks over that hump? It's hard to say. I mean, he's kind of like the joke of basketball because of his recent appearances in the playoffs where his team's blow leads on a historic level and no coach in basketball has blown more leads in the postseason than Doc Rivers. But at the same time, if he gets hired, you'd have to think that Giannis Antetokounmpo is 1,000% on board with it. I think he's going to have a huge say in who ultimately gets hired. Like you alluded to earlier, I don't think the assistant is going to be having that interim tag for very long. I think they are going to bring somebody on. Now, Doc Rivers, again, I'm kind of wishy-washy on if that's going to play out any better than it probably would with Griffin. Corbin, who's your favorite outside the box? If it's not Doc, Gri Doc uh, Rivers, who mid-year would be the most interesting to you? I mean... I'm first going to say, I, I I think it probably will be Doc. It's weird. I think CNN, which I think, just like Chris, didn't know was like a thing of sports, like, released. But, like, yeah. I saw it announced on TNT. I know the connection between TNT, CNN, all of that. I think it's more Milwaukee pushing back now to say face on the fact that Joe Prunty was an interim coach for seven hours. Like, I think it's more of that than it probably they'll just announce a Doc tomorrow afternoon. And then it'll be like, there we go. That's an adequate amount of time. That's at least my thought process. But I definitely think it's going to be him. But if it wasn't. I mean, you kept hearing for years Jeff Van Gundy as, like, a rumor. Like, hire the guy. Give him a shot at this point. Otherwise, why bring him up? It's like, um, coaches, I don't know. I imagine if I was to leak news to newsbreakers about this. We're considering, and then you look at the last six NBA on ABC commentators, and you're like, Mark Jackson, Jeff Van Gundy, and this as, like, potential candidates. Like, he was announced as a potential one, what, the, today as well. So, like, yeah. I think it would be interesting to see him there. If you're going to be in the room that much, you've had – Decent coaching. He was a good coach with New York. He was a good coach at Houston. Yes, it's been about well, almost 20 years, but like he did a good job there, right? In my mind, if he's a candidate, like give him a shot. It can't be worse than Doc. I mean, but aside from that, I guess you can go, you know, some of the other guys. There's uh, Nate McMillan, you know, kind of the retreads who've been around for a bit. I feel like you're going to get one of those guys anyway, especially since it is midseason. And let's be real, I love it, but you're not going to battle with Joe Prunty. And I, I, that's just not what they're going to do. I think it's, I might be wrong here. I'm going to guess it's Terry Stotts. I think he jumps back in. I just think they bring him back. Lillard's going to have the push here this way. I think there's obviously a good relationship there. There is continuity. Stotts would obviously take it. I My gut tells me it's that, but if I'm the Bucks, I mean, I don't know if you could do this. I don't know if there's a precedent for this in, in basketball. But bringing back Boonholzer would be hilarious and something we should all be rooting for of like, hey, we made a mistake. It's a great relationship. Look, we you won us a title. Mm -hmm. We tried to go away from the drop. We didn't realize what we had. We had to go explore. It's like the Boy Meets World episode where uh, Corey's out there and uh, he's in. Uh, I don't know if either of you guys watch Boy Meets World, but do you remember the episode where he gets caught up at the ski lodge talking all night with another girl and then he he just he doesn't he forgets about this great thing he had with Topanga briefly it was a momentary mess up and it cost him everything they broke up momentarily they go to the art exhibit sorry spoiler alert for the mid 90s show but wow. um yeah. then they go back and they're like yeah well then they go back and it's great <laughs> boot and in the bucks probably should have just read that out like yeah it sucked that you got upset in the first round but like mm -hmm. maybe you should have just let that one go and just kept that train moving and just chalk it up as sometimes you get upset um, I don't know. <laughs> Boonholzer coming back would be hilarious. I mean, pride from mm -hmm. Boonholzer probably would prevent that, but mm -hmm. I don't know. It's not. It's not broken. President, look at Steve Clifford. I, that's with true. The Horn, with the Hornets, right? Bobcats and Hornets. Yeah, but I'm saying, like, you know, he he resigned or he left, moved yeah. on. They were about to hire Kenny Atkinson. Things fell apart. They said, "Let's bring you back. Why not?" <laughs> <laughs> you know. So yeah. Um, I think there's I also the it. issue, too, that all these reports have come out that the Bucks are adamant that they want Doc Rivers. And then if mm. they don't get Rivers, it's probably because he doesn't want the job. 
Budenholzer, who obviously got canned, you, you don't want to be second fiddle, third fiddle. Like, you know, th- th- like you said, there's a pride aspect to that. It would be hilarious for us to chat about, yeah. but mm-hmm. in reality, it's pushing it. But it's also probably the best yeah. basketball fit, right? Like the best choice. Like you'd rather oh, yeah. have Boonholzer than Doc at this yeah. point, right? I'd like a well, lot I mean, of people more than Doc. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they couldn't live with their own failure, so they went back to you know to quote. I think it's gonna be Stotts though. End game reference. My gut tells me it's Stotts. Okay. I think it's Stotts. Um, Corbin Rozier to the Heat. How does he fit Kyle Lowry in a first round pick uh, to Charlotte? We'll see. The weird thing now is because of the new CBA, Kyle Lowry can't bounce to a couple of uh, big time uh, luxury tax teams. So Denver and a couple other ones he can't go to if he's bought out. Um, He also can only be traded uh, individually, uh, I believe, uh, based on uh, this kind of deal. So we'll Mm -hmm. see what ultimately happens with Kyle Lowry at this point. Does he get to reunite in Chicago uh, with Chris's old friend, DeMar DeRozan um, for a little bit of time? I don't know. But Rozier to the heat feels like he's a, a good heat kind of player do you like the playoff upside of bringing in somebody like terry rozier and do you think he fits with what the heat's main rotation cogs bring to the table corbin so i'm going to answer that question i've got to first start he is going to reunite with uh demar Derozan with the lakers so i just want to put that out there. oh um, okay yeah, he's not demar's out of chicago he's not going to chicago i'm kidding about whether demar is going to the <laughs> I'm thinking about whether DeMar is going to the Lakers, but I know for a fact that DeMar is probably not staying in Chicago. <laughs> Chris is out. You, you've yeah, hurt Chris too much. Right, cool. Good night, everybody. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasure <laughs> meeting you. <laughs> but no, um, as far as Tay Rozier, I think it's interesting. I think, I mean, I've been, I've been a big fan of Rozier. He literally mm. is part of my wallpaper with Russell Westbrook, Latrell Sprewell, Monte Ellis. I'm not going to go into it. It's a thing. But yeah. like, he's my type of player. And He's in the midst of a career year. You know, he's played play a lot. He's missed a bunch of games, but he's played a lot of them without LaMelo Ball. Unlike last year where he really kind of collapsed under the weight of having to have the dual role of being a focal offensive point uh, for them and also someone who had to, like, get others involved. He has really done well in this role, right? He's in the prime of his career. He turns 30 in March. Um, he's averaging 23 points, six assists, shooting, what, 57%? true shooting and on shots that are pretty hard because it is charlotte and like there's not a whole lot of guys who could create off the dribble um he also loves said, shooting hard shots that man lives for it like he makes him look harder like he he's like i'm hitting a step back three i don't care i am making this as physically painful to watch as humanly possible like oh, yeah. rosier loves the tough shots he he loves those. oh yeah oh he's the king of the uh, pump fake step back and then i'll think if i can shoot okay if i can't pass it, you get it right back I'm shooting it. Like, He's in LA yeah. fitness 10, 15 years from now. MVP like Terry Rozier is like that dude. You walk in, you're like, Nope, Nope. Like he's just running the court, just doing all <laughs> kinds of stuff that you're just like, I, who is this guy? And you're like, how, the, the, yeah, how no, do you do Terry it? Rozier is a uh, phenomenal yeah. watch in that kind of, uh, off in, in the half court. He's, he's a lot. Of fun. Yeah. He's a big three MVP in about five years. Honestly. Yes. That's another yeah. good call. Yeah. But no, I think he fits a uh, Miami. Let's be real. They need offense, right? They need shooting, more consistent. He brings that. He definitely brings more than Kyle Lowry, who played admirably and played a lot while they were injured. Like, no disrespect to him, but Kyle Lowry's 37, kind of fading, right? Um, It's fine. I think, you know, he's in a decent uh, uh, contract, I think. Um, And so that's interesting. Um, Miami, though, they need what he brings to the table. And he's somebody who can initiate offense, and that lessens the load for Jimmy Butler. That lessens the load for Bam on a bio. That lessens the load for Tyler Hero. And it also lessens it for Terry by extension, right? Because he is someone who can now capitalize on making shots. He's made 39% of his threes, of his pull-up threes this season. And 50% of his mid-range shots, which is still, like, unsustainable and crazy. But it's been going on for 40 games so far, right? It mm-hmm. with Charlotte. And so you wonder on a better shot tied, because Miami does have more threats than Charlotte does, that he'll be a little bit of a better role. I think I'm more concerned with him defensively. Um, than anything because he is kind of undersized. He definitely competes. Like, don't get it wrong. I've watched, I mean, I cover Charlotte. He's like, like it's just, it's not great, but it's not for lack of effort for him, really. It's just like someone who's like 6'3 and not very like big. You know what I mean? But he'll definitely try. Um, and I guess for Miami, they've made other guys like that, Deion Waiters and other guys throughout the years. Like, they've made that work. I guess we could mention Duncan Robinson. Like, they, for the most part, unless you're like just egregiously bad, you will find a role there. And so I think that's good. So, all in all, I think it's solid. I mean, Hopefully, you know, it's a smoother transition because he's in a much less demanding offensive role and he's not going to have to take half of the tough shots that he did in Charlotte. Although, as you mentioned, Chase, he enjoys those, but maybe he'll be able to rein in some of his, you know, more uh, risky shot taking inhibitions in order to kind of better fit with this team. And I really think it could be a good fit. And I mean, Chris, 
isn't it just kind of like he's the upgrade over Gabe Vincent or they never really replaced Gabe Vincent uh, from free agency. And like he he's an upgrade there where I think he probably starts. They're not going to have a true point guard. And this is one of those good fits, I think, for Rozier where he's just they're like they're just positionless basketball over there and they're just going to find a role him and hero i think will coexist uh, pretty fun especially in the regular season and i think more than anything right that he helps when jimmy sits like when jimmy's taking uh time because jimmy's getting up there in age and you have to be very careful with how much you're expending uh of jimmy butler in the regular season that he needs to be ready to go come playoff time and terror is is that ultimate guy to get a lot of those shots and pick up the slack when jimmy's not not available or not looking to be a high usage guy right yeah, I mean, I think isn't that Miami's MO where they get the most out of the least? And mm-hmm. I think Corbin kind of touched on it. Like, if you're having a backcourt of Terry Rogier and Tyler Hero, they may be capable of scoring 30, 32 points themselves, but they're giving up 40 on the other end because they can't stop anybody, which therefore yeah. puts more pressure on Jimmy Butler and Bam Matabayo and company to play more defense. Now, I wasn't, I think this deal is fine. In hindsight, I don't think it moves the needle in the Eastern Conference. I know it's kind of convoluted there in the middle of the conference. I don't think Terry Rozier boosts their ceiling per se. I think there are going to be some defensive issues incorporating him into the mix. But he is that guy. And it's kind of a weird looking back because he was in Charlotte and he was like the one or two option, which he won't be in Miami. Can he accept a lesser role? Which I think he can because he wants to win and Miami gives him the best position to do that. But at the same time, like... The defensive issues are going to be more glaring. I think Kyle Lowry, even at 37, is a better defender. More leadership intangibles, of course, obviously has that extremely good rapport with Jimmy, you know, best friends. And I don't think he's going to be a Laker. I think he's actually going to end up in Philly. Uh, Charlotte will buy him out. And I think he'll end up going back to Nick Nurse. Uh, He's he's a local boy with the Sixers. Uh, It probably gives him his best chance at a championship. It would be cool to see him reunite with DeMar in Chicago or L.A. if, you know, in, in a perfect world, I suppose. Uh, but I don't see that happening. But yeah, this is just kind of one of those trades that kind of shocked me because it included Kyle Lowry. But I think Miami is kind of in the same position it's in. They get a little bit of an upgrade at the point guard position. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Yeah, and we'll see. I don't think they're done. I, I Do we agree on that? Miami still probably got something else to do ahead of the deadline. They need something else. They need it. Yeah. Right? I don't know who it is, though, because I feel like they would have to go to Hero. And Hero's been really fun. I don't know if y'all have watched a lot of the Heat this year. But, yeah, I mean, he's obviously a lot of fun uh, for the Heat. But Tyler Hero has been, he's cooking. And Tyler Hero's floater is one of my favorite things in the NBA. Love Tyler Hero's floater. It's a nice floater. We, we, oh, I think we should, we've been, <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, we debated this one, Chase, uh, on, on his floater. Yeah. Um, there's a few, there's a few guys out there, but you, you definitely love his floater. And I agree. Um, also, Chris, that was, yeah, Philly's a really good, I hadn't even thought about that. And yeah. that's like, that's like a perfect fit, you know, as somebody who like leadership, clutch threes, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I like that a lot. Chris, Chris Finch, very upset at his team after a 62 point showing from Carl Anthony Towns and a loss where he goes two for 10 down the stretch, um, goes four on one uh, at the at the buzzer and does not get a foul call throwing something up. And uh, Finch was quite upset at his team's effort and what happened. And then uh, because Anthony Edwards is always hilarious, was just like very blunt about it and I, i'm paraphrasing but he was like yeah that's about what happened um in terms of like them not playing uh the right way this that and the other uh trying to get uh carl anthony towns buckets because he started off so hot uh do you agree with chris finch being that open and uh what did you make of uh cat's explosion and then the hornets speaking of the hornets ended up getting the win here in, in the fourth quarter i, I would have been way more vulgar to the media after that performance, I thought Chris Chris Finch was actually putting it lightly, which is crazy considering some of the things that he said. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I caught some of the highlights of, of that performance from Cat. It, it was so weird seeing it on the same night as Joel Embiid's 70-point mm-hmm. performance against San Antonio. That was wild. On the anniversary, too, of Kobe scoring 81 of all nights. Yeah. Like, just crazy in, in hindsight. But it, it, it's weird because Minnesota is in a position that they're not accustomed to. They're first in the Western Conference. Everyone is looking up at them, but it's a matter of taking them seriously. And then they put forth a performance like that last night where, you know, just on paper, they should be decimating the Charlotte Hornets. 
but then they let you know the aspect of of trying to get towns as many buckets as possible to make history and and extend the record or what have you that was the priority more so than winning the game and if you're the clippers if you're the oklahoma city thunder if you're any one of these other powerhouses in the west you see a performance like that and it shows Minnesota's inexperience. How seriously are they taking this? Are they just kind of enjoying the fact that they are as high as they are right now in the standings? And then when push comes to shove in the postseason, they'll be an easy out because they're just not used to that type of pressure. I think that's kind of what Finch was was trying to get across to his players was that, hey, it's, Carl was great last night, 62 points, fantastic. But you lost focus on what was the most important thing, and that was closing out Charlotte made a lot of mistakes late, you know, officiating aside or what have you, that was the big takeaway from that game. You can score 62 points, but if you lose the game, who cares? It's like when Devin Booker scored 70 points against the Celtics and they were in the locker room and they were holding up like the Wilt Chamberlain piece of paper saying, this is what Booker had tonight. Did they win the game? No. And that's what ultimately matters. I also think, so this line from uh, Tom Lee over on Defector, very good website that everyone should go subscribe to. I thought this blog, the last line was just brutal, but also it 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 does ring true. Uh, and I'm curious if you guys feel the same quote for as disappointing and darkly funny as Towns, career best scoring night turned out to be. I can't say it was exactly surprising that things went this way for him. If you had asked me yesterday morning, which NBA player was most likely to score 63 points while also being the key cause of an embarrassing loss to the Charlotte Hornets and have his performance overshadowed by a 70 point game from Joel Embiid on the same night. I would have picked Carl Anthony Towns. Some athletes uh, stand out as an example of what it looks like to live a truly blessed life. Others are a reminder that even the best of us can't fully avoid eating blank. <laughs> Beep. <laughs> I mean, it, it is just brutal that Cat, who's been compared in the Embiid stuff forever, and um, to have that kind of explosion in that way, and Embiid do it on the same night and win and drop 70 this that and the other i will say i was watching the thunder broadcast so i was watching thunder blazers which um y'all glad i tuned into that one chauncey billups had every right to absolutely lose his mind because uh the thunder absolutely stole that game uh tonight billups i don't know what else he was supposed to do to get that timeout called and uh they keep possession and they end up winning the game most likely so that was insane but uh, they ask like who was the like the broadcast uh, i forgot who was the color commentator for the thunder Oh. Off the top of your head, do y'all know? In a blank. Thought you were um, yeah. he, for the Hornet. he played for the Sonics um, and a couple other teams. Oh, I... Michael Cage. My bad. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like talking. He's like, yeah, well, you know who the last guy to score or what record he broke in Philadelphia, right? And he asked the play-by-play guy. I'm talking like 17 seconds of silence. And then I think he guessed Dr. J. No. And then he asks, he's like, guess again. Like, he wouldn't leave it alone. So I'm talking like a minute and a half of this broadcast is him being like, do y'all, we're doing, we're calling an NBA game. Do y'all not, oh, what are we doing? And then he asked the sideline reporter and they guess somebody. And I think they guess Moses Malone or something. And nope, still wrong. And he never answered it on the broadcast. So he never said Wilt Chamberlain. He just, he, like, that never happened. But it was an incredible reason as to why I watch League Pass. Because you never know what you'll hear. And I'm just like, what what's happening? There's two minutes here of him just being like, how do y'all not know who Will Chamberlain is? How do uh, what are we doing here, folks? What 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 are we doing? I don't, um, I don't think about fraudulent one hundred. I'm just kidding. Oh, I mean, kidding. it was uh, it was great though. Um, was either way, game. Corbin Corbin's corner NBA thoughts or NBA thought that is it fascinated you the most since last week's pod? What what's been on your brain? I mean, I'm gonna go with the Lakers, and I'm gonna go with the unpopular opinion here. I think that there needs to be changes for sure. I think that the roster was just kind of ill fit from the start. I mind you, and I'm saying all this, and I like the offseason moves the Lakers made. Um, mm-hmm. even Gabe Vincent, which I mean, never bet on Miami Heat guards or, or former <laughs> Miami Heat players. If Miami let you go, think about why. I that's just my I mean, we had the Kendrick Nunn, and now we're doing Gabe Vincent. But like I would say the thing the biggest thing for me that's been an issue um is to talk about trading for like DeJounte Murray. Mm. Or a player, or I, I mentioned, I made fun of, I made meant, made light of DeMar DeRozan. But, like, players like that who don't actually fit what the Lakers need. It's happened being big names, and they're very talented players, and I get that. But what the Lakers need, ideally, is a third, like, a bigger defensive-minded guy. Someone who could hit open shots. You know, someone who could hit shots, period, would be nice. You know, someone who could play alongside LeBron AD, maybe scale up their offense when they're having off nights or being more distributing, and then, like, tone it down a bit when those two go off and you just some combination of that. And I just, the pieces that have been proposed, I mean, I guess Chicago seems like the best fit because tomorrow, I think 
of any of them can probably do on the offensive end, even though there's some clear limitations there, and hopefully some package of Isaac Russo or Andre Drummond, something like that. But I'm just hearing, like, the, and it's being, like, reported from, I don't know, whether reporters and such are carrying water, whatever the case may be. You hear DeJounte Murray. You hear all sorts of random players. And the big chip that's there, and it makes sense because salary matches, the, is um, D'Angelo Russell. And mm. that's becoming a whole thing. And I just don't think that makes sense, um, especially since I feel like D'Angelo Russell has been playing really well. Um, I would say since he's been a starter, he's been great for the Lakers, but he's been doing exactly kind of what you want a point guard off of LeBron AD to do, and that is to just make shots, scale up their offense, you know, keep the defense honest as far as an offense perspective and not be horrible defensively. And so I I just don't know why the Lakers are – I mean, I know why they're making him the player, but if you are, like, doing better than a DeJounte Murray deal, to me makes – makes it, it just makes more sense to do something different. And so I'm just – the what I'm hearing, obviously, on social media, which doesn't say a whole lot, that sentence sounds ridiculous, but, like, it just – I don't know. It makes me wonder about what the Lakers' priorities really are. And they don't have a lot of bites of the apple here. LeBron, like, has been playing great. He'll be – he's 39 now, right? AD's been having a remarkably healthy season. It's age 30 season, right? Like, I don't know. There's just not a lot of bullets left in the proverbial chamber for the Lakers to keep expending on ill-fitting and bad ideas off the jump. And I feel like the Lakers are trending that way again. And I'm like, if you if you got to use Andrew Russell, I wouldn't do it. But I'm not against, obviously, trading him, a Ruhachimura, even an Austin Reeves if it comes to that. But just making sure that's a deal that makes sense to fill the actual team needs that the Lakers have. I think DeJounte takes maybe one of those. I think DeMar DeRozan takes maybe one of those. And ultimately, that's just not worth it to me. Chris, is there a trade with Toronto? Is there something, is there a package where you get DeRozan to Los Angeles? Is there, do you want D'Angelo Russell on your team? Do you want Austin Reeves in this rebuild? Is there, is there a partnership there potentially? Dude, haven't we been through enough this year? <laughs> like how many of my star players do you need to take and feed all these other teams vying for a championship? Look, the OG and Anobi trade with the New York Knicks like worked out perfectly for everyone. Knicks get this elite three and deep guy. The Raptors get RJ Barrett, local kid. Emmanuel quickly point guard of the future. And then even Pascal Siakam to the Pacers to a lesser extent. Like I kind of, it, the writing was on the wall that it was going to happen. And we at least got three first round picks for it. But I keep seeing all these rumors online about like the, the Lakers are interested in, in Bruce Brown or maybe even bringing back Dennis Schroeder. What the hell do they have? <laughs> that a, <laughs> Like a growing team that's clearly not in a rebuild that because Masai Ujiri doesn't want to use the word rebuild. It's a reset. For the Toronto mm. Raptors, I don't see how bringing aboard a D'Angelo Russell or even an Austin Reeves kind of expedites that process. They don't fill any need that the Raptors currently have. Russell is pissing off the Lakers on a daily basis, other than these outbursts that he has scoring wise that kind of, you know, soothes the waters, so to speak. But yeah, unless it is a three team trade that sends Russell or Reeves elsewhere, keep the Raptors out of it. I mean, we did give you a sorry, we gave you Dennis Schroeder. I'm just kidding. But, that's one of those relationships oh, thank, where it's like you for that yeah like he should have stayed <laughs> and the lakers should have kept him and it's happened no. twice now the lakers keep yeah. doing this where it's like alex caruso should have just stayed and oh, then it's I, like dennis Schroeder, you should have just stayed mm-hmm. by the way as we're talking i have the lakers game on the side and camera has just pulled up lame so like mm. injuries have just been a big factor not as big as darvin ham would like to say but they have and i don't know i, I feel listen i'm i've been a laker fan for since like two, since i was little so like we're talking mm. like early 2000s right I've like D'Lo, I feel he definitely, I think he's handled it as well as he possibly could. He's basically been a trade ship since he's been traded to the Lakers, right? And like, mm-hmm. he could be a bigger distraction than he has been. I'm not saying that he hasn't been a distraction. He definitely sees himself as a bigger, better player than he actually is. But like, that's his job. You know, I mean, his job, not his job is to be a distraction. His job is to score, right? Like, that's what he's, he's a decent floor general, if you will, but he's not like your kind of Mike Conley point guard or a Chris Paul. He's more in the vein of a scoring point guard. So like, and him being able to shoot, like, I think he's just doing his job. I just feel like him being, I don't know, it feels like the, the flight is being thrown his way just because he happens to have a $17 million contract that works in trades is a bit much for me. But, like, that's my thing. But I've been with him since the Nick Young years. I'm, I, I didn't root for him. I actually wouldn't be traded back then. But, like, right now, it's just like, I just don't want the Lakers to do what they've done before, where if you look at it, 2020, defensive-minded roster, you know, they they, they kind of made points happen, right? You know, LeBron was a little bit younger. AD was dominant. Then you had the playoffs where he just couldn't miss a jump shot. Boom. 
Then they say, okay, we're going to lead more into offense. Let's bring in Montrez Harrell. Let's bring in Dennis Schroeder. Let's compromise some of our defense. Let's bring in Mark Gasol. And then we saw how that worked out, right? It still wasn't that bad. But they said, okay, chuck it all. Now we're going to trade everyone for Russell Westbrook. We saw how that worked out. They said, okay, now we're going to bring these guys back. And now we're going to bring, you know, D'Lo and Jared Vanderbilt and, you know, um, um, at the time, Malik Beasley. And we're going to remake the team that way. And we saw what happened. And now they want to do another change. Like, that's what I mean is that type of, like, wholesale changes here. You got one championship out of four years, and you reconstructed the roster basically four different times outside of LeBron and AD, right? And so I just don't want them to try to do another seismic change where just, they're just not that good. Like, they're a decent team, well, but I don't know. Uh-huh. It, it, it's despera- it's desperation because you're trying to maximize the remaining years of LeBron James's career. And you True. can't – it's kind of like what I talked about earlier with the Milwaukee Bucks where Damian Lillard is, like, in his mid-30s right now, and you can't afford to waste one of his prime – like whatever's left of his career he's not he's still playing at a prime level but he's not in his prime per se mm-hmm. if the lakers throw this season to the wayside yeah like lebron james is defying father time but he's going to be entering his 40s like is he still going to be a guy that can carry you to a championship so if they need to do wholesale changes and make drastic roster moves that's kind of the the, the position that they're being pushed against like what other choice do they have at this point no, I, and, and that therein lies a conundrum. I get you're right because they they have to, but it's like I don't know. I feel like they've missed several times. Like they so the, the best this best success they've had out of this swing and miss, swing and miss was this past year. But now you know maybe we don't know. They they had a great streak. It was great. Um, they made further changes in the off season. Brought in some guys. I get it. They've been injured, but the the core that they the core that they brought in at the trade deadline of last season is still mostly intact. But now they're going to try to do wholesale changes again. And it's like, okay, like each one feels more diminishing returns in my mind. Like I thought this last trade deadline was perfect. I thought D'Lo, okay, offense. I thought Jared Vanderbilt, defense, Malik Beasley shooting. Two out of three ain't bad. But like given what, what they've had and it's worked, and right now, like the West got tougher. You know, the West got tougher. And, and it sucks and I get it. But like the moves that are being like tossed around right now because of what you said, Chris, they have to do something. But like I, I just – I don't want that to be the sole logic to make a horrible move. You know what I mean? Like, I'd rather them sit pat and be like, okay, let's hope we get these guys healthy and see what happens in the playoffs than then to make a trade and make it worse because they felt like, oh, I don't know. Like, we have to do it. You know? It's, it, this is why I'm not This is why I'm not running a team, among many reasons. But, like, that is the mindset of, like, what I'm going with. And as a fan of, like, wanting this team to be good, yes, but not just for any big name or has-been star. Like, actually address some issues. And all these players are being tossed around you know, you squint and you see it. Like, there's no – DeJounte Murray is talented. DeMar DeRozan is talented. All these guys are there, but do they fit with the Lakers or need? And that's where I feel like you have the questions, you know? Well, it could be worse. You could be trading DeJounte Murray for 70 cents of the dollar of what you acquired him for and then proceeded to lock him up to a long-term extension. And then Fair enough. just be in – Real, real purgatory here. NBA purgatory. It could be worse. I do love that Masai is fighting the whole rebuild. It's like we were talking to Vivek uh, last week, uh, Chris, and it was like I told him and he, he was tweeting about it today or the other day. And he was like, yeah, this is going to be bad. Like you just it's one of those where you have to watch the Raptors post Pascal and post uh, a couple of other guys. And we'll we'll see. It gets ugly in a hurry in the NBA. Like you're not going to be Pistons bad, but like you can call it a reset. But no, you're going to be bad. Like there's not a there's not anything left in the cupboard. Like when you lose that much talent and that top in town, when you've only played six guys for the last three years, it's going to get ugly. And Scotty's super young. And now Scotty's your best player. Like whether you want to admit it or not, like the Raptors, sorry to say they're they're in for, I think, years of just basement dwelling in in the NBA, which would be good for them, I think. I, I did say after 2019 that I gave them like a decade of goodwill. Yeah. So if I need to withstand some below 500 seasons, some, you know, lottery picks along the way, then so be it. I still got my replica championship yeah. ring stored away somewhere in a cabinet. Cool. I can't find it. I hope it's there. But again, when, when you win a championship, it changes kind of like your philosophy, yeah. at least as like a fan and someone covering the team. That's also, really, like yeah. you should have to wear the purple and the bring back the dinosaur, uh, the Raptors logo, like the actual 90s Vince Carter McGrady during the bad years. I think that should be required for Toronto. When they go through a rebuild, they revert back to those uniforms. And then when they're ready to contend again, they go back to the Kawhi red, black, and white. You you, you should, whatever your worst season was in franchise history, if you know you're bad, you should wear that coordinated. Right. I think that's like the bots. Whenever they're bad, they should wear creamsicles. It's just great. Like we all know. 
Can like, we get the that. rockets and the pinstripes then? Yeah, the rockets and the pinstripes. That also works. Like I'm, I'm here for all of this. On top, yeah. yeah. Just do that for that's new fun. fans. That's how we dictate who's bad in the league is what they're wearing. Okay. Yeah, like Vancouver, yeah, like uniform. Memphis has to wear Vancouver all the rest of the year. Like yeah. they only can wear Vancouver stuff the rest of the way. Um, but we'll see. Uh, Corbin, your league pass team right now, and why or why not? Uh, would you recommend watching the Portland Trailblazers at the moment? Um, aside from DeAndre Ian and the magic that he is, um. No, I'm kidding. I just, I, yeah. I mean, they're a fun team. I think the Portland Trailblazers are, are, are they're a bad team. We get that. They're a young team, but they do have some interesting pieces. Whether you're looking at it from who's going to be available at the trade deadline to which guard will be on the Orlando Magic in three years to, you know, just is Chauncey Williams the coach to kind of get these guys together? There's a lot of questions there, but I love, you know, seeing the continued development of Scoot Henderson. Like he has looked horrible to start, but he's really turned a corner over the last month. Like he's looked better, which like, Rookie point guards, give him time. Who'd have thunk it, right? Um, but, like, he's looked a little bit better. Um, Anthony Simons, I think, is really starting to lean into the role of kind of being the primary offensive creator um, and, and doing it in a way that's more consistent than it was. Um, Want to see more change and sharp for sure, but, like, that's a thing. Um, and I, I, I'm i looking at it really as someone who, like, lived in Arizona, was a big, I mean, bear down, U of A, you know, saw it. Like, I really, joking aside, want to see Aiden step up. It, it mystifies me why he's not as big a role on this team. And some of it is because the guards on this team are either a, you know, still young developing his passes, B more shoot versus guards or C have very little chemistry with Aiden, like Malcolm Brogdon there. But at the same time, like the dude is taking the least, like least amount of shots taken years. Like he's not nearly as assertive. And then when he is assertive, it's like stuff that isn't really dominant. You know I mean? His, his nickname is dominating, but he's like, I don't know. There's another word. He's, he's just not that. So they're a mystifying team for me, but they have talent. Their, their potential is through the roof there. Uh, I'm sure a fun team to play with in 2K. If, you know, if I play 2K, like I think that there's a few things there that are interesting to watch. And I think they have the kind of role playing um, players, whether it's Tumani, Kamara, or Duop Breathe that are like really interesting to watch from a prospect and development perspective to really see kind of what they have in their game for what they're adding through the course of the year. I think that's always one thing that's attractive about bad teams if there is really anything is like seeing what kind of development and what that development chart looks like over the course of the season you know as you're watching players and what they add to their game what kind of role um what kind of role they kind of carve out for themselves based off of what they were given so yeah that's not is that necessarily the most fiery speech to watch the Portland Trailblazers but like even to, to tonight's game against the Thunder like it went down to the wire if it wasn't for like an egregious call who knows you know it was a fun game just last week they had a fun game down to the wire against Brooklyn and Anthony Simons had a game winner. Like they're, they're a good yeah. squad. They're a good bad squad. There you go. I think Reese better than Aiden. Is that a take? Is that a, is that a fiery take? It shouldn't be. I'll leave it there. He's better. Like you watch, I watched the whole Blazers thunder game tonight. I don't know what Aiton does that's better than Reith. Like Reith can drive and kick. He's a be- he's better in the offense. Like I think he does more things that help you win basketball games. Uh, in and out, he's just feels like more of a team player. Like I I really like Reith. I you know he's fun. I think Jeremy Grant still really solid. Um, I think Anthony Simons. One of the cool things about him, he's got a pure shot. He's a great offensive scorer. I think he's just only going to continue to get better on that side of things still super super thin like the guys never put on weight i thought he'd get a little bit bigger uh over the years in the nba because he came in so young but he's still still pretty uh pretty thin and i don't know what he is if he's a starter on a title team we'll see down the line Jaden sharp's been out so we don't know what there is scoot chris like the what we thought dennis smith jr could be like is that is he like the best case scenario oh. dennis smith jr like dennis smith had this kind of type i'm I just when I watch Scoot, they play so far off of him. He had a really good shot at one point in this mm-hmm. game, one three. They do not respect Scoot Henderson's jumper <laughs> as a rookie. Like the Thunder were playing extremely <laughs> off um, Scoot Henderson. I don't know. Uh, that just is something I jotted down where I'm like, is he like best case scenario, Dennis Smith Jr. when he was a rookie? I admittedly, I admittedly do not watch a lot of Portland Trailblazers basketball, but when I do, I keep my eye on Scoot Henderson because he was mm-hmm. kind of like a sexy rookie of the year pick, and that obviously hasn't panned out whatsoever. I kind of see like the Dennis Smith Jr. like comparisons, but it, 
again, as someone who covers the Raptors and a lot of people wrote off Scotty Barnes after the first year when he won mm-hmm. rookie of the year and then he had a bad sophomore year by his standard that he said his first year, like I'm not ready to say Scoot Henderson can't be more than what he currently is, but there is a reason why defenders are not respecting his jumper it's because he doesn't have one. But that yeah. doesn't mean he's not going to have one for the rest of his career. So obviously I would Portland would obviously want more bang for its buck initially with you know that kind of a pick for Scoot Henderson. But I, I still think there's enough talent there that he can exceed this Dennis Smith Jr. ceiling that he probably has right now. And it's not a slight. Like I just like Dennis Smith Jr., people forget like what he I, I was really in on Dennis Smith coming out of NC State, like what he could potentially be. Like it's easy to forget what guys we what we all felt like when you go back and read the draft boards and like what NBA Twitter was saying about guys and like, oh, what a steal. He's gonna be great here. And then you see him in the league for a little while and you're like, oh, this is not who they're going to be in the league. This is not gonna go the way that you thought it was gonna go. And I mean, we'll see. I I think Scoot's got a lot of time. There's a lot of things to like. Uh, I'm not sure what he'll ultimately be, but the Portland just uh, they fight hard. Like Portland's still fighting uh, night in, night out. So I would recommend watching the Portland Trailblazers. They're fun um, as a league pass uh, team right now. Uh, final thing here, and we'll wrap up on this edition of the program here. Uh, Chris, why this? It's in your name, Walter Wild NBA trade idea of the week. The trade deadline coming up in just a couple weeks. Your favorite one that you could throw out this week is what? Give me your trade. Look, it's not going to happen um, because you. It doesn't have to happen. This now. is what makes it wild. You can. This doesn't have to be in the realistic space. It, it, it's not really. It's not really wild. But I've seen a couple people bring this up. I think Lori Markinen would be a goddamn perfect fit for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Like, mm. I, it's one it's one of those moves where and because they're they're sitting on like a treasure trove of draft picks right now. I, if Markinen were to join the Thunder, they might be my NBA championship pick. I think it's that kind of a move wow. where Oklahoma City is just like on the brink. And it's kind of like what I said earlier with Minnesota, where once they get into the postseason, a lot of people won't respect them because of their inexperience. But I think Markinen can be like that defining piece where if you put him in the Thunder with Shea Gillis Alexander, you have Chet Holmgren to kind of cover his defensive, you know, inefficiency with his shot blocking and what have you. I think that's kind of like the perfect encapsulating fit where Oklahoma City Thunders or the Oklahoma City Thunder ceiling gets that much bigger to the point where they are a legit title contender. Now, whether it's draft picks or if you have to move someone like, you know, a Dort to kind of make the money work or what have you, I think if if Utah was kind of like at the like the bottom of the seller kind of team, they had that amazing, you know, winning streak and now all of a sudden they're vying for a play in spot. It's not going to happen at this point. I don't think Utah is going to be a, a seller at the trade deadline. But if, if something drastic were to happen where all of a sudden you hear reports that Markinen is available, Oklahoma City, pick up the phone. I do that tomorrow. What's the deal? Like what what if you're trading Markinen to OKC? Because you're dealing with Danny Ainge now and you're dealing yeah. with the Utah Jazz and they're playing really good basketball. Uh, I highly encourage people to go listen to Thinking Basketball's podcast on the Utah Jazz um, last week, I think it was, but um, it was really, really good as to what's happened and what's flipped the script and why they're in the play-in conversation. They have a lot of leverage where they don't have to trade Laurie. He's, uh, he can be a long-term guy if they want him to be, but they could. I, I don't know. What's the, what's the move? Um, who are you giving up? Because I think you're going to have to give up someone big in your core. And I just, it's not going to, you can't just get away with case and Wallace and um, Lou Dort. I think, I think it's going to have to be like, obviously Shay's off and Chet's off. Like, would you move on from Jalen Williams for Lori Markinen? Cause I think that's what I would the starting move, point. Would be I wouldn't move. I wouldn't get rid of Williams. I'd get rid of Giddy. If, if, if Utah you need is more. willing to take on Giddy, but you're also, I, I almost kind of see it as like a similar package. Maybe not, exact but kind of what la had to do um for paul george where Mm. you got like a really young piece and then just like a draft picks coming out of the wazoo and that's what Mm. oklahoma city currently has if you give them a young piece like giddy maybe one of your bench guys and then like three or four draft picks to you know just to entice them at that point i think that would ultimately be enough if utah was willing to part with marketing but kind of like what you said considering where they are in the standings right now i just don't foresee that happening in my personal viewpoint of wanting Oklahoma city to thrive. Perfect situation. What do you think, Corbin? Do you like Lori and uh, OKC? Well, I think it's a great fit. 
Yeah, absolutely. I I think that was probably the the like the one I most want to see outside of one that will no longer happen. I want to see Pascal Siakam in, in um in Dallas. Like mm. I wanted to see that. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, but like that obviously is no longer a thing. Laurie Markin into Oklahoma City will be there. A nasty team, man. Like they are one of those young teams that are that like he brings exactly what they need. You know, like you said, from those from that position with his shot making and just yeah, there's a lot there to like and. OKC has the assets where it really wouldn't be that big of a deal for them to like go out and get him. And he's still like what 26, 27? Like, yeah, there's too many reasons why that would work. Let me let me pose this question to you guys. Obviously, not knowing what pieces would be outgoing, what team would have had the higher ceiling? Oklahoma City with Lori Markinen or Dallas with Siakam? Oh, Dallas with Siakam. Yeah. You said wait, what team would have had the higher ceiling? Mm-hmm. Like yeah, in the like postseason, what, what like team in... gets further in the playoffs? Like, is it Dallas? Oh, I would, I would. Because considering the the, the bench that Dallas yeah. has, they'd have to give up a lot. Like Tim Hardaway Jr. would have to be outgoing and whatnot. But with yeah. Oklahoma City, they'd probably have to give up a little bit less because they do have those draft picks. But if we're exactly. operating under health, like, are we saying that they're both healthy in this scenario? Both teams are healthy. We're going based on kind of what we know is the, the, the history of these guys. Yeah. Like Kyrie might miss some time. Doncic has missed some time. Like. We're going just based on just pure, you know. I'll still take three guys off. that are in the top 30 in the NBA right now. And I'll still fair. take them in a postseason run. Like three guys who are firmly in the top 30. I, I would. Two guys would, in the top 20. Yeah. No, no. I like, like, I still like that. But I think I would go. I mean, it's not the most <laughs> world brain theory here. But, like, I would probably go OKC okay, because they've already been better. And they're getting upgraded. Mm. Like, all things be cool. They're, they're better then Dallas has been. They're getting upgrade. Dallas getting upgrade, but they're giving up less to get that better fit for them. Where Dallas is probably giving up more to get that better fit. Then you go in the postseason where I think it evens out a little bit because yes, Dallas has superior talent, and I think they're better at making shots in those scenarios where we haven't seen a Jalen Williams in the playoff series yet. We haven't seen a Chet or those guys yet. But what you know, and they're a younger team, so there is some doubt there. But at the same time, like. Listen, they, it's, been, it's legit. Like, what we see has been legit. That's a very good question. I'm going to lean Oklahoma City um, just because I think they have different ways of doing it. And, yeah, they could be a team that, you know, stalls out in the postseason. But I just, for some reason, think Laurie would be like that hit of, I don't know. Very young teams don't win in the postseason. Like, they're one of the youngest teams. Like, this is, they're in uncharted waters. And as of right now, they're the number one team That's what's uh, weird in the though. West. Like, like they're not your normal young team. That's what I'm thinking. Like they're not the things they're doing. Yeah. Like it's just not done like that, you know. And that's what's throwing me off a little bit. I think because you're right. Like young teams don't win the postseason. Young teams also typically aren't number one in the West in you know dang near February. Yeah. And you're, and you're well, being I think very it just depends on who they like get. Dallas right. Big three, but like mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, look at it this way: Gilgis, Alexander, Holmgren, Markinen. Are you telling me those three are not top 30 players in the NBA right now? Top 35 at worst? I don't think Chet's a top 30 player yet. Um, Lori. He's knocking on the door. Is he knocking? I'd have to put the list in front of me. Like, I'd have to think about who the who's in my 30. Um, I don't know. I still I, don't. Yeah. I don't trust that core. I don't. I wouldn't go all in with that. I really wouldn't. I don't think he can win. We'll be doing this. I show think he'd be really good. Up. I don't think he can win. I, I don't know. And I also think the Thunder, the Thunder and the Wolves are just monitoring the standings because like it's going to be so interesting because you have the Suns here at the sixth spot. They won six straight. The Kings at seven. I think everyone wants the Kings. Like if you're the Thunder, the Timberwolves, you yeah. want the Kings in the first round. You want probably the Mavs second. The Lakers will see they're right there in that nine spot. Like if it's Suns Thunder in round one, I'm picking the Suns. The Suns are beating the Thunder in a seven game series. Like I the Kevin Durant and a healthy group, they're winning that series. Like I think I, that's if be they're healthy. If they miss one of their big three, I think they don't win. I agree. If they're healthy, they're beating the Thunder. If they're, they're healthy, the if they're healthy, I think it's a good challenge. Yeah. I think I think Phoenix is one of those teams where like their depth is what I worry about for sure. Oh yeah, hundred um, percent. And their big three, like when they've they they also have this nasty habit, at least they have during their six game winning streak, of like pulling out the game. But digging themselves in a massive hole to start, yeah. And so I don't. It's not. It's not. It doesn't inspire full confidence in me. Let me just say that. But oh, at the end no. of the day, you know they have good talent there. But I think OKC would be a frisky team that would give them problems, just like Minnesota would give them problems. Like I definitely wouldn't immediately say Phoenix for sure on that. I, I would at least say go six.
Okay. Did you see the report that just came in, guys, from uh, Woj that uh, Chauncey Billups, uh, Portland's going to be filing a protest after uh, good for the him, man. Nice game. But there you go. I mean, he's going to win, but that was one of the more good. egregious things I've ever seen. Like, I don't know, it, folks, go watch the video. I don't know what else Chauncey Billups is supposed to do. Like, he is standing right next to the referee, yelling, "Call time, like timeout." Like, I don't know what else you're supposed to do in this situation. <laughs> I think Tom Tom Habersfield said on Twitter that they had two of the most inexperienced like refs in the league currently roughing Checks that out. game. Which, yeah, so there you go. Thank you. Love the NBA for that. The Timberwolves okay. of officiating. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, uh, oh! So what was it? Um, what was the Timberwolves game where it was like, a, oh, Steve Ma? What was it? Um, what was the terrible official who was not Steve, not Mahorn? Um, Steve Malone. What was it? Um, why am I like this? Is like OG ESPN True Hoop Network stuff. Um, this is gonna drive me nuts now. Like it was a whole video with Kevin Love. It was the David Kahn era. Maybe it happened with Rubio or um. Alexi Shaved, what was it? Oh, sh- what was it? Timberwolves uh, referee ending. Oh my god, this is gonna drive me nuts. Um, <laughs> this might take me a while to figure this out. This is some niche stuff. I'm not gonna do this right now. This might take me a while. Uh, Chris Walder, what can the good folks check out from you all across the internet this week? Dude, I'm everywhere, man. Almost t- like it, it, like too much for people. So if you mute me on Twitter, you block never me on too Twitter, much. Walder, I totally get it. Never too much, Walter. I like I like to hear that, man. First of all, yeah. absolute pleasure coming back on your podcast. It's been too long. Hopefully, we can do this again soon. But if you do want to find me online, I have started with the team at Odd Shark. I am basically kind of leading up their NBA side right now, covering basketball on the daily. So check out my work there. And like you can Ed see Malloy, here in by the, the video, way, it's Ed Malloy. It was driving me nuts. Oh, Ed, Ed Malloy. Malloy. Oh, Ed Malloy oh, in a Timberwolves game. That, sorry, that just. Ed Malloy. There we go. Yeah. That made me feel better. I wasn't going to sleep tonight if I could not remember. That was on that. You. I'm happy for you, Chase, because that was thank gonna, you. Yeah, I was that was up driving me up the wall. <laughs> oh, Ed Malloy. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Continue. And uh, of course, like you can see on the video here, uh, Raptors Republic. I'm doing some coverage for them as well. And follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Walder Sports. There you go, Corbin Ford. What about you over at Round Ball Ramble Basketball Intelligence and Swish Theory this week? Yeah, I'm following Basketball Intelligence. We put out, you know best NBA writing we kind of put together um, every day. Uh, there was a piece we did, well, Mark Medina did for Basketball Intelligence on DeAndre Ayton, which was funny, um, but definitely uh, <laughs> that's like the one word that came to mind for me. Um, but I helped put that together, kind of do some, you know, sharing of that um, and work with some fine folks on that. Uh, Switch Theory, we you know, great work on draft content and just general um, roster building and, and, and player profiles. We dropped a lottery big board 1.0. Um, that I was happy to contribute to. I did a piece on um, Rob Dillingham and Kyle Filipowski. So that was the thing. And then Ramble Ramble, which is your daily NBA recap show um, with the scores of what you missed and what you should have watched and what you didn't watch and everything there. So definitely make sure to check that out. Thank you, Chase, for coming on. As always, have a pleasure here. Um, in fact, yeah, that that, that that's, I'm excited to always be a part of uh, talking about with fine folks. And a pleasure to meet you, Chris. There you Bye. go. I love it. The Chase House Podcast, bringing folks together. Corbin, Chris, thank you guys as always. And I'll talk to y'all both very soon.